Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast today. I'm joined by the host of Locked On Raptors, Sean Woodley, to tell you why OG Ananobi will be worth every penny despite his injuries. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. I want to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today. And every single day, because that would make you an every day. Or if you want to join those elite ranks, uh, you can subscribe on YouTube and hit that notifications bell to ensure you never miss an episode or five days a week, pretty much every week. So definitely get that done. And also hit the auto download function on your podcast platform of choice. And that'll ensure you don't miss an episode there as well. But who will be talking to you five days a week? I'm Gavin Shaw, your favorite play-by-play broadcaster's favorite play-by-play broadcaster um, and a a great run uh, covering the Phoenix Suns back in the day as a credentialed media reporter. Now five years doing this podcast covering your New York Knicks. And today we're talking about one of the most important Knicks uh, currently uh, on the injury list, OG Ananobi, what his free agency is going to look like, why the Knicks should ultimately pay up for him. And then we're going to catch up on our old buddies in, in, in the great North beyond the wall, Emmanuel quickly and RJ Barrett. So all that next on locked on Knicks. As promised, uh, lucky enough to be joined by Sean Woodley. If you're listening to the Locked On Raptors side, I'm Gavin Shaw. Thank you so much for tuning in, Locked On Knicks, Locked On Raptors crossover. If you if you hadn't got enough of the two of us talking hoops, we're going to keep doing it. Uh, checking in on the trade that was Sean. Uh, I think I think we're both still feeling pretty good about the deal. Uh, a, a few months later. Yeah, man, it's like uh, it continues to be a really nice win-win where everyone's happy. I mean, no one in Toronto is happy right now because the the team is all out of the lineup and Ochai Abaji is starting and playing 35 minutes a game, which, hey, no shade to Ochai, but, you know, maybe 18 minutes is his his sweet spot. But, yeah, man, it's still a trade that I think has set the Raptors up in a much better way than they were set up before. And as far as, you know, how it's going for the Knicks, I think the results speak for themselves when they've been healthy for sure. Um, OG in particular, he's been ridiculous. And hey, it's happy to like nice to see like Precious Achua doing some stuff as well. Dude, he's been, he was the shock of the trade for him. Is when, when they got him, I was like, all right, this is kind of the ultimate insurance move. Just maybe buy 10 minutes here or there until Mitchell Robinson's back. And lo and behold, after a pretty nondescript start, he's been one of the best offensive rebounders in the NBA. Super fun pick and roll partner for Jalen Brunson. Um, I don't know if the Knicks, the Knicks might have priced themselves out of re-signing him now, um, unless, <laughs> unless, unless they trade Mitchell Robinson. But that is a problem for another day. Um, the free agent I wanted to focus on uh, is OG Ananobi. Um, Clearly, the, the Knicks need to keep the guy because they play like uh, maybe maybe this side of, of the Boston Celtics and Denver Nuggets, the best team in <laughs> basketball when he's healthy. Um, statistically, there's an argument that they're even ahead of those teams. I think it was it was tracking for the first five games, maybe even through his first 10 games, had like the best net rating in NBA history for any new player. And and as much as I was like jealous watching Emmanuel quickly rack up 14 assist games and R.J. Barrett <laughs> all of a sudden figured out how to shoot threes and have an efficient 24 and six, um, I was I was feeling pretty good about things. And then uh, what's always what's always kind of been the the catch with OG uh, happened and and that elbow injury got the surgery. Uh, we thought he was all good. Uh, two games later, he's screaming in pain. That, that was the universal description of it. And uh, we, we don't know uh, when we're getting him back. So, Sean, I, I present all that to you as someone who has has far more of a relationship and a history with him than I do. Um, what are the Knicks to do this summer? And, and, and in in more pressing fashion, how are they to handle this injury for someone who is very much adjacent to Jalen Brunson, the future of this franchise, and also someone who will make or break their playoff hopes in the present? Yeah, it's a tough spot, right? Like, I think for this season, it's a bummer. Like, it, it just would be lovely if OG could be out there and, and helping this team do very fun things like he was helping them do, right? Like, they looked like, I, I don't know if I totally bought the whole, oh, they can actually, you know, give the Celtics a run thing. Cause I don't think anyone's given the Celtics a run. I hate it. Yeah. It makes me sad to think about, <laughs> but it's just like the horrible reality we live in in this hell world. Uh, <laughs> but I do think the Knicks had a real like claim to being the second best team in the East, you know, a playoff series with the Bucks. I was hoping we might get that 2-3. It seems like maybe that's not super likely considering how the standings are shaking out. Um, but that would be a really fun one. You know, the sort of super duper star of Giannis versus the like depth and team vision and defense of the Knicks would have been an absolute blast to sort of dig into as far as the X's and O's go. Um, but I, I'm with you in that like the Knicks got to pay OG. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it's going to take. I think 
the Raptors moving on from him suggests that it's going to take a lot because I think if it was going to be something like 30 million bucks a year or even 35 a year, I think they would have said, you know what, we should probably just keep this sort of generational wing defender that just there's not many guys who do what he does to affect the game on the defensive end while also being a positive player on offense. It's just a really hard combination of skills to find. And so I think you just got to pay him and hope that the injury stuff doesn't derail future seasons. And you hope he comes back this year, obviously. I think the hard thing to parse with OG's injuries, which like there have been a lot of them, right? He's never played more than what, 69 games in a season. I guess 74 as a rookie is his high water mark, I should say. Um, you know, that was coming off of knee surgery, which caused him to drop in the draft to the point where the Raptors could take him at 23. It, it's weird because it's like, it's all like fluky weird stuff with with og it's oh a weird elbow spur thing oh it's like a weird uh you know he had a, an appendectomy in the year the raptors won the championship like it's never been one thing that keeps on popping up for og he gets like poked in the eye all the time and missed some time for that when he was with the raptors like it's just like a a strange and unfortunate series of non-chronic injuries that you hope don't compile and sort of slow him down before he should be slowing down. He's only 26 years old. You would hope that he's got plenty of good runway before him, but the injuries are weird. And, and I think it probably played into the Raptors thinking when they decided to move on from him, um, you know, lots of other factors at play with that team. And it wasn't the only thing I'm sure, but you just, you can't not pay a player who does what OG does. So I, I don't know what you do. It's a tough spot to be in. Um, and, and you might just have to pay him and, and hope for the best. Because letting that dude walk, you know, the Raptors are feeling this right now. The one thing the Raptors badly need on this roster is like a 6'8 wing who can defend everybody. The second you move one of those guys or don't retain one of those guys, you spend many, many years searching for one of those guys. And so if you got one of them in, regardless of the injury history, I think you just got to pay him, which is uh, it's a tough place to be for OG, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, look, he let's be honest. He ha he has the Knicks by the basketballs, right? Like, like any number he says mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like the Knicks just have to acquiesce to after what they gave up, and and presumably, like I I think within five to ten million dollars, maybe ten ten is a big number within five million dollars. Like this contract's probably been hammered out. It's probably hammered out between uh, Leon Rose and uh, Sam Rose, and um, like over the uh, Christmas break, right before this trade um, mm -hmm. got done, and that's probably why the Knicks felt comfortable making the deal, but it, it is a disaster of epic proportions. If he's not back with this team. Um, and, and then, I mean, to add to that leverage is, is just uh, to that point, like how exceptionally good they've been on the court. I, I'm with you that it's a long shot that they could beat the Celtics, but I mean, the regular season numbers they put up with them in the lineup were kind of similar to what Boston's doing this year. And it, it wasn't all against cupcakes. I mean, they, they killed, they beat the Sixers by 30 plus points with Joel and beat, they beat Minnesota at full strength. They beat Denver uh, fully healthy by like 35 or 40. Like he just made the, the fact that he allowed the Knicks to go four out, which they've never been able to do with Jalen mm -hmm. Brunson. I mean, heck, as long as I've been covering the team, they never put four shooters on the floor while overwhelmingly being the best defense in the NBA. I think what's what's interesting, and I think you might appreciate this, the numbers, and and it's still a small sample size, and we thought we were going to get more of it until this latest setback with the elbow. They've been quite a bit better with OG and Brunson on the floor than OG, Brunson, and Randall on the floor. And again, just because it hasn't been a large sample size, you don't know what to make of that, but the net rating is, is plus 45. I mean, going into mm -hmm. the two games that OG played through injury with those two. And it, it, if you're a Knicks fan, if you're a member of the Knicks front office, it like kind of opens your mind to this future where like, all right, what if we replace Randall with like a really high level, like creative, like three and D wing and like doubled and tripled down on that and kind of got to the model that the Raptors had when they won their title, which was like just a horde of great wing defenders around, maybe not a Jalen Brunson, but an excellent point guard in Kyle Lowry and Fred Van Vliet. Um, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but I say all that to say like, there's not, a world I think where the Knicks could go away with OG and he's just such a skeleton key to so many different lineups. And mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm so interested in his future, but I'm also just a little worried about his future. Is, is this going to be the reality that they're always dealing with where another injury is just around the corner and, and you just have these fits and spurts of brilliance in, in between? Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Again, there's not really anything predictive about his injury history. You know, you think yeah. back even to like 2020, 2021, like he missed time for COVID. It. and like what are you gonna do like like not sign a guy because a global pandemic might knock him out for 20 games it's really tough it, it, it's yeah. i don't know 
like if you're a front office, you might feel a little bit queasy, but I ultimately think like, don't overthink it. He's really good. He is driving positive play when he's on the floor. Guys like him are exceedingly hard to find. You just got to do it. And, and like his entire career, he has driven positive play significantly when, he knows, when he's on the floor. And I think you like you like to your point, you put an even more sort of space heavy, you know, roster around him where maybe he's, there's, you know, I think there's probably a little bit of overlap, probably some of the same stuff that you saw with Barrett and Julius Randle, yeah. you know, the OG Randall, you know, are those guys able to coexist offensively? They seem to have done just fine, but long-term that's a question for sure. Um, you know, depending on how much they want to ratchet up OG's usage, I, you know, his, his shooting points and, you know, the usage are all down with the Knicks, but it doesn't seem to affect anything because he just drives such winning basketball when he's out there. You just got to do it, man. Like 40 million bucks, 45. Like, I, I don't know what, I don't think it'll be a full max. Like that feels pretty unreasonable considering the way the landscape is going in the league. And so if it's less than a full max, I think you just got to say, you know what? Injuries might be part of the deal here, but this guy, like to your point, he's the skeleton key who unlocks so much, who makes so many different kinds of lineups viable, who can guard all of the best players that you're going to need to need to guard when things matter most. Injuries are part of every team, right? Every team has to deal with it. Every team is susceptible to an injury derailing their playoff hopes. I don't think you can build your team around the fear of injury, especially for a guy who, again, it's not like he has the same recurring thigh injury or, or whatever that keeps on keeping him out of the lineup, like, say, Kawhi Leonard. And even then, like Kawhi Leonard, you keep that dude around too because, he's yes, he's injured a lot, but he's also incredible when he plays. OG, not Kawhi, but a similar idea. I think you just got to not overthink it, pay him what it's going to take. And uh, that's kind of how it's got to be. Gavin, there's a guy the Raptors have to pay uh, that they acquired in the OG and Anobi trade. Emmanuel Quickly, he and RJ Barrett have played extremely well. We're going to talk about them coming up in just one second. But first, you got some words. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit is only available to U.S. customers. All right, we are back. Locked on Knicks, locked on Raptors. I, I, just, I just wanted to put a bow on the OG and Anobi conversation. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you got to the core of it. Like at the end of the day, this would be a conversation, a difficult one. If there was any ambiguity about his fit with Jalen Brunson, is Jalen Brunson top five score in the NBA right now, bonafide uh, dark horse, uh, get some token MVP votes, all NBA type talent. Like the, the first question you ask is, does this guy fit with Jalen Brunson? And OG Ananobi is out of anyone in this league who hasn't made an all-star team, maybe anyone in this league who hasn't made an all NBA team, like the possible best fit with this guy, like hands down, yeah. like covers from defensively lets the Knicks, a team that it, even against your Raptors at times was just getting bullied in the early portions of the season and look small when they played the Celtics look small when they played the Pelicans and that like after the trade, it just, no one was doing that to New York. And that's before they get back the best offensive rebounder in league and basketball. The Knicks have built their identity around just about everything that OG Ananobi is about. He is, he is a picture perfect fit for Brunson, a picture perfect fit for Tom Thibodeau, this front office, this organizational ethos injuries be damned. They're, they're going to pay him a very healthy amount. And I think the way the cap is going, it'll, it'll end up aging extremely well, unless uh, God forbid these injuries to basketball, God forbid uh, this injury situation gets worse. Uh, someone Toronto has to pay as, as you so beautifully segued, uh, Emmanuel quickly, uh, my, my basketball sign, uh, maybe, maybe <laughs> still like my favorite player in the league in the mix. Um, I want I, I feel like I sent my kid away to summer camp and I'm, I'm getting a letter home. I'm, how, how's, how, how's my guy been doing, Sean? I've been, I've been box score watching every single night. seems to be having a great time up in Toronto. 
I mean, I'm having a great time watching him, man. It's a ton of fun. Uh, he is like my dude. I, I, you know, you know this. I telegraphed hoping the Raptors would go and find Emmanuel quickly on their roster some way, somehow back in the summer. And for the deal to come to fruition the way it did was like a real like, oh, I nailed that one kind of day. It was fantastic. And so, yeah, I've like totally gravitated towards Quickly's my dude. And I cannot get enough of watching him play. He's been out for a little bit. Uh, for some personal reasons, he's ramping back up, should be back for the last eight or nine games, it seems, as uh, same as R- with R.J. Barrett, who tragically lost his brother, who, who also is in the midst of ramping back up. Um, but yeah, quickly has been a total delight. And I think the shocking thing to me, and I'm curious if you have sort of thoughts on, you know, did you see this coming, is he has like adapted to the lead guard, point guard role so quickly. Like it just, you know, it... it it took a little bit. His first little stretch with the team was, you know, he wasn't being super aggressive. He wasn't shooting enough. Darko Ryakovich, the Raptors head coach, was just on him to keep on shooting, play with joy, keep on shooting. And as his three-point volume has ratcheted up, he's also blended in this really, really nice pick-and-roll playmaking, sort of diving and kicking, all this nice stuff uh, that you want to have from your lead guard. It's been a treat. And I- I'm curious, like, did you see lead guard Emmanuel quickly coming did you see a guy who was gonna you know flirt with a 20 assist game in his first couple months with the Raptors which he recently did you know the stretch where post Scotty Barnes injury early March Emmanuel quickly was kind of the guy on this team and he was doing a lot with that opportunity I'm excited to see what he does in the last few games once he comes back but uh, yeah did you have any inkling that you know more than just like a sort of microwave scorer off the bench dude was sitting in there and quickly so I have a lot of thoughts on this. It, it, it brings both uh, joy and, and stress to my heart when you ask that question. The stress <laughs> comes from, I want, I want to zoom back to the 21-22 season where Tom Thibodeau, uh, in, all, in all his brilliance, uh, and I, I say that uh, mostly genuinely, some, but somewhat sarcastically in this context, um, thought Alec Burks was, was the Knicks point guard um, for the second half of that season after after the Kemba Walker experiment did not work out. That, that, just, that feels like 100 years ago, as I say. That. <laughs> um, I, feel, I feel a million years old, Sean. Um, but anyways, um, and, and then uh, something uh, sad for Alec Burks, uh, good for Knicks fans happened. Like I think he, he suffered like a minor injury. And for the last five or six games of the year, the Knicks were, were totally out of the playoff race. And Tom Thibodeau said, all right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the responsible thing here. Maybe with, with a little bit of nudging from the front office, um, I'm, I'm going to let the young guys cook. And it was it was the Obi Toppin and Emmanuel Quickly show. And Emmanuel Quickly, having not gotten a real opportunity to be a starting point guard in his whole career, came out and and just looked the part, like was making the right reads, was balancing, mixing and scoring, but had an innate sense of like, all right, this guy hasn't shot in in 10 minutes. I, I need to get him a shot. Um, Obi, like he's he's going to be open, rolling to the rim if I if I stunt this way and, and fake a pass to the quarter first and and, and just making like like under an innate understanding of how to manipulate a defense at an NBA level. And then over the next year plus, like that would be there in fits and spurts. But I think the issue for Emmanuel New York is that his role was, was rarely ultra consistent because he was obviously asked to come in and be a starter. Sometimes he was asked to come in and be a scorer. Sometimes he, when certain lineups, he needed to lean a little bit more into that facilitation. And then like the start of the year after that, like he was asked to like go back to playing next to Derek Rose again and figure out how to be an off ball guy again. And I think that really affected him. And even in, in the playoffs, like last year where he really struggled, that affected him. You knew it was in there. I mean, his stats, like we went over it when we were talking about the initial trade were, were exceptional last year. Like he, he played like a borderline all-star. He was like 22, five and five um, in 20 or so games. Maybe not quite that many, but close to that many as a starter. Um, and you could you could certainly see the makings of it. And even early this year, just some of the reads he were making were just better and quicker. And I think a little bit more intentional than in the past. The only question for me was, all right, like, would this guy be able to do it night in and night out against other starting defenses? And if, if I had a seed of doubt in my mind, I, I think sometimes when we highlight these guys off the bench and say, I mean, Obi Toppin's a good example of it and say they need a bigger role. This guy's so amazing. And, and then sometimes you see it against starters and it just doesn't quite look the same because we just mm-hmm. underestimate, I think, the, the physical rigors and, and just the challenge it is to, I mean, like on the other end of the four to be chasing around. I mean, how many point guards in this league average 20 points per game right now, like 14, 15, like it is just <laughs> a challenge. And um, I mean, no one puts in more work than Emmanuel and he he's clearly been up for it. So I'm, I'm really happy to see it. Um, and and so there were there were signs there, but he's he's kind of even surpassed my expectations with how consistent he's been in Toronto. 
Yeah, I mean, he, like I said, he's kind of surpassed my expectations as well. The one thing that's been kind of strange, and I think part of the sort of growing pains process of getting acclimated to being the dude, uh, you know, especially with Scotty Barnes out where he has been like full on capital T H, the capital T, capital D, the dude Mm -hmm. is he's kind of had some trouble with the floater game, which was always this sort of uh, incredible little feature of his game that you'd see when he was playing with the Knicks. And, you know, I figured, hey, it's just going to translate over. He's going to hit every floater. It's going to be incredible. But, like, scoring inside two-point range has been tough. That said, March, February and March are really good for him, kind of figuring that out a little bit. I think he's just kind of getting used to the physicality, to the lack of space when he's driving, the fact that teams are, you know, keyed in on him as well. Um, So I think it's been a bit of a a growing pains thing. But that's what this Raptors season is about at this point, is growing pains and figuring things out to kind of get them sorted ahead of next season, where I think they want to try to be pretty competitive again. And so, yeah, I, I'm uh, I'm super happy with how things have come. The, the, the stuff where he struggled, I think, has been uh, totally workable stuff that I think he has to struggle through in order to get better. And then the three-point shooting, I mean, it, it's just like an absolute whirlwind watching this team play with the above-the-break three-point shooting threat that quickly is. They just have not had that. Even Fred Van Vliet, you know, a very good pull-up three-point shooter himself, but didn't quite terrify defenses the way it seems like Emmanuel quickly does. And I think quickly in particular working off of Jakob Pertl and working off of Kelly Olenek a little bit there too, like his connection with those bigs, the way they spring him open for looks has been really fantastic. The one thing they haven't really figured out is the connection between him and Scotty Barnes. I think that's kind of the biggest question yeah. from the the time they spent playing together it's been a bit of a tricky combination i think they're you know figuring out their timing figuring out how they want to connect and pick and roll pick and pop that type of stuff and that hasn't been perfect but overall i think the connection with his teammates has been fantastic and he's really kind of living the lead guard lifestyle in a really really uh exciting way i've had a ton of fun with it um rj barrett let's talk about him quickly here uh he has been just like like I've watched a lot of RJ Barrett, watched him for Team Canada. Uh, you know, I, I was a kind of a little Nick sicko before this trade, even because I liked yeah. those teams a lot. Mm-hmm. And you know, RJ Barrett was always someone who kind of left me feeling like, yeah, okay. And we know the sort of discourse around the trade was, oh, he's just a throw in. Oh, he's a toxic asset. You know, says unnamed coward scout X or whatever. Um, <laughs> like clearly not a toxic asset. Clearly looking like a building block for this Raptors team still just 23 years old and like the way he's like trimmed the fat out of his game, the way it seems like um, the sort of lack of overlap with Julius Randall and Jalen Brunson is, is like pretty remarkable. Samson folk does great work covering the Raptors for Raptors Republic, public. Um, and he's kind of theorized that simply not being on a team with a bunch of lefties has helped RJ Barrett because he's not competing for the same space and teams are not, you know, geared up to, Oh, we know everyone's going left on this team. Like it's a bit of a zigging while the other Raptors zag now where he comes flying off these screens out of the right corner catches, puts it on the deck and you just can't stop him. He's been unbelievable at the rim. How much did you think this was in RJ Barrett? You know, I think his sort of transformation has been probably more surprising than quickly where I think everyone knew, okay, They're bringing quickly in to be the lead guard here, to be the sort of pillar next to Scotty Barnes for the long term. We'll see about Barrett. He's completely transformed himself as a player, and it's been an absolute treat. You know, the defense we're not going to talk about today because we're staying positive right now. Um, But on the offensive end, totally trims the fat. The efficiency's off the charts. Um, Was there anything that sort of had you feeling like, okay, this type of player is here with RJ, or is this like a complete out of left field surprise for you? I mean, you hear you hear the alarms going off uh, outside my house. That is the uh, I'm I'm stunned by by this R.J. Barrett development. <laughs> I, maybe maybe that's overstating it a little, but the level of efficiency he's hit, Sean, I I did not see coming. Some of the reasons you highlight why I did see coming is reasons he could get better. I want to talk about that in just a sec on both Locked On Knicks and Locked On Raptors. Before we get to that, though, today's show is brought to you by Amazon Fire TV. I love Fire TV. I don't have one myself, but my parents do because I bought one. And I was like, what's the way my parents can easily watch TV at their house in the country where they don't have to worry about all these different changing inputs and all this stuff? They're very, very simple people technology wise. 
Amazon Fire TV was the answer. Fire TV is your destination for sports, from live games to highlights to in-depth analysis. Fire TV offers amazing viewing experiences with smart TVs, as well as the Fire TV stick that you can plug into your existing TV that provides access to millions of movies and TV episodes, as well as free and live TV. That's one that my parents got, and they love it. They spent the entire winter in the country, cold, stuck inside, watching their Fire TV. They could not be happier. Whether it's opening, uh, whether it's for opening weekend for baseball or the college basketball tournaments on the men's women's sides you're going to want to have a fire tv fire tv recently created fire tv channels to deliver a constant supply of the latest videos from your favorite sports brands all for free that includes those of us here at locked on locked on knicks locked on raptors it's all there for you as well as all the big pro sports leagues and college conferences as well fire tv channels let you dive into all of the game analysis highlights and more to keep up to date on all the latest in the world of sports march madness nba mlb lots more not to mention great news entertainment gaming travel cooking videos as well be like my parents check out fire tv channels on fire tv and alexa devices if you haven't checked out fire tv channels you should trust me on this to learn more visit amazon.com slash locked on fire tv today's show is also brought to you by our pals over at nissan gavin are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further are you are you Big time. Nissan Big time. might be for you then, baby. Of course, they have their lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store are built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. I love saying that copy. I don't know why. It makes me feel very, very good at talking words. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect midsize crossover for your next adventure. And you can also check out the 2024 Nissan Armada. It'll change the what you expect from a full-size SUV. Picture a rugged 4x4 that can seat up to 8 in first-class luxury and style. Tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 Armada. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. All right, time to talk uh, some R.J. Barrett. Uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't. I, I've both been a little jealous and a little blown away by by what he's done in <laughs> Toronto from an efficiency perspective, particularly from a three point shooting perspective. The one thing I've always been ultra confident about in R.J. Barrett, and and the one thing we've seen from him his entire Knicks career is that he is absurdly good at at getting to the rim. And and that is like mm -hmm. if, if there's a quality you zoom in on, and you say, all right, like why was this guy the uh, third pick in the draft. Why was he the number one prospect coming out of high school? Um, why is he still garnered so much interest in the NBA despite years of inefficiency? And to your point, uh, mostly poor defense with spurts of, of pretty good defense mixed in. Um, it was it was that ability in, in an environment that was not at all conducive um, for him to be able to do that with Mitchell Robinson for almost that entire time parked right at the rim 24 seven and say, <laughs> Hey, RJ, congratulations. You beat your man. Here's a center to block your shot, but don't worry. I'm great at getting offensive rebounds. So it's going to look bad for you. It's going to look really good for me. And I wonder, this is almost under, I wonder if Mitchell Robinson becomes like more of a mediocre offensive rebound now that RJ Barrett <laughs> isn't on this team to, to miss layups, but also take the big man out of the play. <laughs> That, that's something to watch uh, going forward for you Knicks fans listening. Um, but point being, like there was that, and he was never playing with, or or I shouldn't say never, but he was rarely playing with three other shooters on the floor. And Tom Thibodeau got mm -hmm. better as time went on about giving him a lot of run with the bench unit, making him and quickly um, Cole Fulcrums on that. So any any chemistry those two have, you can thank Tibbs for that. I mean, what he's done over the last year with with those two guys, but. I, I, I didn't really see this like just because like there have been moments where like the context has been pretty decent for him and like games and and it just seems like every time he figures it out like he would lose it and it'd be 10 games of, of everything clicking and us doing a podcast saying RJ Barrett is turning the corner suck it haters in, including us sometimes and then it, we would regress and we were riding that roller coaster the whole time which is why I was ultimately like I, I think the feeling was maybe even like relief for myself. But also for RJ, because like what he did well, to your point, like there were two guys in New York who just did it better, I, at least mm -hmm. at least at this point, at least in this situation. And he was never going to get an opportunity to overtake those guys. Like the best case scenario was he was a second to Jalen Brunson. And as we just talked about with Ananobi, he was never going to be the fit around Brunson that Ananobi is so cleanly on both ends of the floor. Um, but that being said, I 
I'm amazed and like I'm wondering like can you pinpoint like outside of the superior spacing in Toronto and to your point the lack of lefties like is it playing with skilled bigs is it playing with a coach who's empowering him more like where has the like night to night consistency on the offensive end come from I think it's a little bit of everything, right? Like, I think, yes, playing with skilled bigs who they use their bigs a lot of the elbows. Like, I think that creates a lot of stuff for guys going to the basket, which is where RJ Barrett is headed most of the time, right? As a Raptor, 43% of his shots are coming inside three feet per basketball reference. That is by far a career high. He's shooting 73% on those shots, also by far a career high. It's insane. Yeah, the numbers, so the numbers at the rim were not good. Like we have to say before yeah, he went to Toronto for his whole career. For sure. It's it's baffling, frankly, the, the jump he's taken, but it doesn't feel unsustainable because of the way the Raptors play, where a lot of their sets, like they run a pretty intricate offense. The one thing you can say about this Raptors team this year, they've been a nightmare. They've had like four different versions of the team throughout the year, but they've played Darko Ryakovich's offense and stuck to it all season long. And so even when it's like Ochaya Baji and Grady Dick running the actions, the actions are still the same and they're doing a lot to get guys into space to finish. And I think just Barrett is really benefiting from that. This is not an offense that is going to allow guys to hold the ball over dribble, take their time to size up an ISO. That's just not what's in the DNA of this offense anymore. It was very much the case. Like Barrett would have not fit in in a Nick Nurse offense or not succeed. He would have fit in perfectly the exact type of player, uh, you know, that they loved at that, you know, at one point. But I think this version of Barrett where the decisions are quick, he's being forced to get the ball out of his hands quickly. If there's not an easy lane to the bucket, the threes he's getting are just wide open looks from the flow of the offense, from the, you know, the double teams that a Scotty Barnes, you know, generates, things like that. Like really, really in flow, no pull-ups, like barely any pull-up threes for him at all. I can think of maybe five off the top of my head since he became a Raptor. And so it's just like smart shots within the flow of an offense that hunts smart shots. And I, I think another guy that just, I mentioned Jakob Pertle. His screening is so good, and I think it's been like the R.J. Barrett slingshot. <laughs> like it, it really, that's kind of how you can like call Jakob Pertl. He just will size up whoever's guarding R.J. Again, flying out of the corner, smack a dude with a screen, and then R.J.'s just got all day to grab it, catch, go downhill. Um, that's been like a real staple of their offense. He's also been fantastic in transition as well, which I think makes sense. Like this is a team that lives in transition. They're the highest transition frequency team in basketball. And, you know, Scotty Barnes, when healthy, is one of maybe the three or four best transition orchestrators in all of basketball. RJ's fit in beautifully with that as a, as a lane filler, as a play finisher. And he's actually made some nice reads on the break as well, kind of kicking out to shooters and whatnot. Another thing that's been shocking with him is his playmaking has been not like top of the league. He's not going to average eight assists or anything like that, but he's at four. He's like barely turning it over. Um, you know, he's just been really, really rock solid as uh, a sort of connective piece who finishes a lot of plays for this team. Um, and, and again, I, I use the phrase trimming the fat. It really is what it is. He's just doing stuff he knows he's good at, that the team knows he's good at, and they do it over and over again, and no one can stop them. And it's a pretty exciting thing for the long-term outlook. The defense is going to be the big thing for him. He's been pretty bad on the defensive end. This Raptors team is pretty bad on the defensive end in general. Um, and I do think at some point the Raptors have to find themselves like a big three and D wing. I don't know. Maybe they could use their cap space to sign OG and oh, this God. summer for, or something like that. Wouldn't that <laughs> I, be cool? I, I think um, I quit the podcast. <laughs> Uh, you know, if they could push, you know, RJ to the two, I think that's probably where he's best suited defensively right now. Um, and, but it's weird because he's like so physical. He's so bullying as an offensive player. You would think he could translate some of that physicality to defense. Hasn't quite worked out that way. We'll see how that goes. That's going to be the limiting factor for just how good a team that features RJ Barrett is like their third best player can really be. But, sure. um, everything from the offensive end has been just an absolute delight. And I don't think it feels unsustainable really in any way it feels like it's something he can carry forward within the system and i think he feels empowered i think you know there's the comfort level of playing at home i think he's very proud to be playing at home it's been awesome and uh you know obviously a really tough time for him of late really eager to see him get back in the lineup here and start doing the rj barrett thing again because it's been one of the best parts of this season for sure in a season full of a lot of not very good stuff the sort of groundwork of what this team can be next year through quickly through Barrett, through Scotty Barnes has been uh, pretty encouraging stuff to watch. Yeah. It's like, and, and it's like, I've, I've been joking around a lot. This pod, this isn't a joke. Like it's genuinely like heartwarming to hear that because I think New York 
loved RJ, the human being and, and someone who came in as a number three pick and just like embraced everything about New York from the get go mm-hmm. and, 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 and wanted to be the face of, of that, like turn this team around. And we'd seen so many guys come in here and like, I mean, Chris Stapps Porzingis fresh on our mind, obviously when we got <laughs> RJ Barrett and like, just not take that responsibility and RJ, like, even though it wasn't always perfect, like he never shied away from that. And I mean, both him and quickly were just, just such culture setters on that um 2021 team that set the Knicks on the path they're on now. So I, I think Knicks fans have nothing but positive things to to say and like think and, and feel about those guys. And it's just cool to hear because I he was just never going to be prioritized in New York once Jalen Brunson came to this team. And it, it's funny everyone talked about Brunson knocking quickly out of town. And maybe you could say Randall was was the start of it for RJ, but Brunson was sort of the the death knell of RJ just being featured in a way to do his best in Toronto. It sounds like it's been the exact opposite where they've totally set him up for success. And he he's embraced every single part of that. Um, Sean, we can keep this to, to literally 30 seconds. Uh, do you expect those two to play tomorrow? And if not, what should the Knicks expect from the Raptors coming off a game where we, uh, we just saw the Pistons uh, C team and you, and you don't like, even, even if you win by 20, you don't want to watch a game with the Pistons C team. So can the Knicks hope for a little bit better than that, even with Toronto on a, on a long skid of their own? Uh, Probably not right now because oh the uh, Raptors are fielding what I think is the worst roster in basketball at the moment. Uh, it doesn't sound like IQ or RJ is going to be available. They're ramping up. They are getting their conditioning in order. They've both been out for a bit, uh, RJ longer than quickly. And so it, we're not going to see them against the Knicks. It's a bit of a shame. Uh, but yeah, like you want to see Kobe Simmons? He's there. Jordan Wara? He's there. Ochai Abaji taking 20 shots a game? That's happened. A lot of Grady Dick, a lot of Kelly Olynyk running stuff at the L elbows um you know javon freeman liberty he's pretty cool like yeah this is not a raptors team you will recognize this is not a raptors team i will recognize in six months when i've forgotten this last part of the season even happened because i've repressed the memory um this is not going to be a competitive game i would assume if it is something's gone horribly wrong for the knicks and i will laugh hysterically if that horrible thing does happen to the knicks because you know made a nice trade we're all buddy buddy but they're still division rivals baby and you want to see that blood so yeah uh this is going to be rough stuff for the raptors unless it's not in which case uh it will be truly hysterical and knicks fans will have a meltdown i'm sure i i will um but you know what as our buddy josh lloyd <laughs> would put it we'll be getting 30 minutes of dick and we'll we'll make the most of it uh for for sean woodley i'm gavin shaw uh hopefully we can do another one of these over the summer i kind of wanted to get into the raptors future because i'm just from a team building perspective you guys were confusing to me before um you're confusing to me now still and i want to i want to know a little bit about what the big picture is the dicks certainly have an interesting future in that capacity if any raptors fans are interested and i just i just like talking to you sean so we'll make sure that happens this offseason um but until then he's sean woodley check him out uh, everywhere you can find podcasts. You can find Locked On Raptors. Uh, same for Raptors fans. Wanted to keep track of everything OG over on Locked On Knicks. Um, but until then, we'll each have recaps for you on our respective pods. And we'll talk to you soon on Locked On Knicks and Locked On Raptors.